Hello, uh, my name is Miles Baker and I'm the executive director of the Toronto Comic Arts Festival. Thank you for joining us today uh, for our feature panel, uh, Working in Others Worlds, uh, feature program of uh, the Toronto Comic Arts Festival 2021. Uh, special thanks, of course, to our programming sponsor, Seneca College School of Creative Arts and Animation for supporting all of this year's programming. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the original caretakers of the land that I am on, the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and the Wendat peoples. I'm joining you today from my home, which is in territory that was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, Haudenosaunee, and allied nations. This area is also covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. I make this acknowledgement as a part of a long process in learning what it means to grow up, live, and work on colonized lands. For me, Today, it means reflecting on my grade eight Canadian history class, which began with colonization and rarely, if ever, mentioned indigenous communities. Going forward, TCAF is uh, committed to strengthening its relationship with indigenous communities and increasing indigenous voices and perspectives in our program. I'd now like to turn the panel over to Mark Asquith. Mark Asquith is the secret, uh, Mark Asquith is the secret master of science fiction, according to Neil Gaiman in his book, A View from the Cheap Seats. Beyond that, Mark is a writer who has written for DC Comics, Image Comics, uh, and Spider Baby Graphic. After many years of shaping comic tastes of many Torontonians at the Silver Snail, uh, Mark broke into television with projects like uh, Prisoners of Gravity at TVO, and was a founding producer of the Space Channel. You'll find his name in the acknowledgement pages of dozens of books across all kinds of genres. Uh, and in 2018, he was awarded the TM Maple Award at the Joe Schuster's for his many efforts in bringing comics to Canadians. Nice to see you, Mark, and I'll pass it over to you now. Thank you very much, Miles. I'm very, I'm just thrilled to be here representing TCAF, one of my favorite festivals in the world. Uh, and I, I mean that, I really mean that, not just a comic book festival, it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, in the 80s, I started going to San Diego Comic Convention, and I thought that was the greatest comic book convention in the world. And then TCAF happened. It's in my backyard, essentially. And it's been a place that has really changed um, Torontonian and Canadians' perception of what comics are. And I hope to continue that today, because joining me now is uh, Mallow Hopkinson. And I was just thinking that I met you through, during, actually through um, a time that I worked at Space because you had won the Warner Aspect First Novel Award. And uh, lately you just got the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America Grand Master Award. So <laughs> yay Nalo, fantastic. You've written at least six novels. I don't know how many short stories. And you're now a professor at the University of California, Riverside. One of the things that fascinates me is that you've been interested in comics and you and I have talked about comics for decades. And recently, Mr. Neil Gaiman asked you to be involved with the Sandman Universe comics. And of course, you're writing um, House of Whispers. So my first question, actually, I just want to pull back a bit. Why are you so fascinated and drawn to fantasy as a genre? Oh, wow. <laughs> you, you went way, way back. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, I don't know. I, I give all kinds of answers to those to that question, and I always feel like it's a lie. But um, I think as a kid, I mean, I've been reading fantastical fiction from forever when I was you know, taking my dad's copies of Gulliver's Travels and uh, um, uh, Homer's Iliad off the shelves and skipping to the monsters <laughs> that's what I was always reading um and I think I sort of felt like I was surrounded by the mundane in the best way I had the world around me I wanted more possibility uh and I think that's part of why and you know as I grew older and realized um I'm living as a woman in a black person's body immigrant in these lands, um, so many things, fantasy and science fiction give me a way of seeing a world that actually includes me. And that includes the people I'm surrounded by. Uh, also a queer woman living in, you know, this world. Um, 
so that's part of it too is that i'm able to represent i can i can make the worlds i want i mean uh, i have all the Cal calvin and hobbes collections and when calvin sits down and plays god with his toys it's that feeling it's like ma ha 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 i can make everything and i can destroy it for i am your master um so there's all of that going on it's just it's it's writing is hard but fantasy is just a deep fun and fun at a level that is um vital and important to being able to continue surviving what is that fun bit i mean you know you say that it's vital and i i will explore that later but what makes it fun for you there's a delight in being brought ways of looking at being and looking at the world that you haven't considered before so um fantasy allows its creators to get outside the expected and say but wait suppose they work this way or look at the way things work right now take it to its extreme and what do you have uh so that 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 delight of part recognition and part oh wow that had never occurred to me before um is part of the fun uh and they say that play is the work of children and children it's a it's a 24 7 job for them and they are creating all the time and it's that sense of play that i mean when i say fun it's building your world um that's again only part of it I, I whenever i talk about these things i say everything i say is a lie because it, it cannot be a complete truth <laughs> and why do you think it's vital then i mean you know you have you know this sense of play but at the same time it, it seems to me that in your work you've always had this sense of responsibility you, you've you know you i have to do something with this work what is the something <laughs> <laughs> it took me a, a, actually a little bit to recognize that it would probably be useful to me and to everybody else if I did something with it. Um, it's it can be very easy to to uh, deal with fantasy at the surface level of oh wow let's talk about gnomes and dragons and I can go there, but I need it to be about something. The fantasy reflects on the real world. It it otherwise it would make no sense. Um, and so that sense of responsibility is part of the joy. I don't mean that it's always fun to do, but it's deeply, deeply satisfying to be able to put something on the page that I hope will have some people going, oh my God, there I am. And we'll have other people going, wow, there they are. <laughs> um you talked a lot about uh, at the beginning about uh, world building and, and working that way in terms of mythology. And one of the things we're going to dis discuss today is the fact that you're working in somebody else's sandbox. Um, you're working in the world that Neil Gaiman created for the Sandman. Uh, before we get there, how did you discover his work? There was a well, it's never not been a time when Neil's name was not in the air. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I worked in libraries and then I worked in the arts. You could not not hear about Neil. And then it's partly your fault. I was at the um, International Conference of the Fantastic in the Arts, which happens in Florida every year. And um, this man dressed all in black came up to me and very diffidently said, uh, I'm, I'm Neil Gaiman, Mark Aspitz says I should talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew who he was. <laughs> I think that's maybe why he said I'm the secret master of the universe. It's because I know you. I, I, I'm not really the secret master of the universe. I'm just the guy who introduces people at a party. Excuse me, <laughs> maybe like the... So had you read his work at that point? I had not read The Sandman. Um, I had I didn't read Neil's work until I think I read a couple of his poems and then I read um, the first book in the American Gods uh, series. 
So I waited until he until there was prose, basically, that I could read and got to the Sandman much later. Um, because there's this thing that happens, there's a sort of, uh, well, let's call it snobbery, because that's what it is, where if everybody and their dog is talking about something and saying it's wonderful, maybe it's not so wonderful. And I was so wrong, Neil. <laughs> I was so delightfully wrong, Neil. Well, it's funny because at the beginning, he not, that he was the guy people weren't talking about. It probably took, you know, a year for him to really get up to speed. I mean, and when you remember that he began with violent cases, that won an award in the UK, uh, an Eagle Award. But in Canada, something he seemed to really connect with Canadians, and 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 that I've always been fascinated by why. I, I'm not going to ask you why, because I don't think you're going to know just as much as I don't know. But I find sense. that fascinating. Yeah, it does make sense because, yeah. you know, we consume fantasy. We could we read more Lord of the Rings and Ursula K. Le Guin than than Americans do. I don't really know why. I just know that we do. Um, but but tell me about discovering Sandman for the first time. Did you what did it do to your brain? It's interesting because because I grew up in a literary family surrounded by myth, my dad was a Shakespearean trained actor. As I said, I was pulling books like Gulliver's Travels off you know, our home shelves to read. Um, it felt quite normal <laughs> to me to have all of that brought together. So my first reaction was, yeah, that's what you do. <laughs> uh, why is this so so you know groundbreaking to everybody else? So it it um, it felt like the way one of the ways literature should and could be. So it wasn't this huge revelation to me. I did have trouble sort of the, the the stories have a long tail, the plot lines they they start up and you get interested and then they get abandoned for a long time and you're thinking but what about this over here but by then I had learned to trust that Neil would get back to it <laughs> and so you, you you hang in for long enough everything starts to come together um, and I think I didn't read them all until I started writing for House of Whispers and, and uh, Vertigo sent me all six collections uh, graphic novels of the of the collected Sandman, and that was when I got to to read them all and see the small and large arcs as they develop. And when you get to, I think it's the Kindly Ones, and you're seeing spoilers for anybody who hasn't read Sandman, and you're seeing the Endless from a human point of view. So you're seeing them, you know, mourning the 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 death of of. Uh, uh, the outgoing dream and they are huge there's something about that moment that that sort of gives you goosebumps because all of a sudden you're reduced to your size and you get a sense of what these beings are they're not gods they're something deeper and wider and both less and more so i i that i i love it when stories do that 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 uh long tail that keeps sort of reminding you still here and oh look there's a new thing happening and now it's coming together i really appreciate that one of the things i also really admired about sandman is that because neil was working with different artists at some point he would say to them okay draw the the sandman the way you see him uh, or the way the characters in the story will see him so your point that you know in that arc drawn by mark hempel that we see them as these, you know, giant uh, giants, basically, yeah. um, is very different from, say, the issue that's about the cat. And suddenly you see Dream as a cat or Dream in Brief Lives, where he's a guy wearing T-shirts and black pants. And you think, yes, oh, this is very different. This is the same character. And yet he somehow Neil manages and his artists manage to make him this. You know who he is, no matter what shape he's in. That was one of the delightful things is that you get to re-understand uh, the endless through each artist's eyes. Um, and it does really give a sense of them as being endless, as being, they're always there. Um, you might not see them or you might not recognize them, but they're always there. 
I I really liked that. I I liked the oh, that's still death. <laughs> you know, there's another way of looking at it, or or delirium. I love delirium. Um, so I really like that. That uh, it it's again one of the things fantasy and science fiction do. They they make you reinterpret your understanding of whatever it is, the world or what a hedgehog can be, whatever it is. Um, and so you're always a little bit unsettled. Uh, it's, it's kind of, I get sick as hell on a roller coaster, but I can read fantasy. <laughs> I can deal with that kind of unsettling. Um, many years ago, I mean, probably a decade before you were working on House of Whispers, you came to me and you asked to see some of the Neil Gaiman scripts, which I, I had some. So I lent you a bunch of Neil Gaiman scripts. What was your reaction when you read his scripts? I didn't understand them. <laughs> um, it, it took me a while and it wasn't because of Neil's script. It took me a while to understand writing for comics. I was used to stage plays because my dad, you know, I would read um, the, the, the stage play. I would read Shakespeare's stage plays, um, but understanding what comic scripts are doing is something I'm now trying to teach. I'm teaching both a, a graduate class and an undergraduate class in the graphic novel in the creative writing program where I am and having the students practice writing them. Um, and it took me a while to realize that essentially the script is communicating to the artists. It's saying, here's my vision. So you have to remember always that you are talking to the artists if you are not the artist yourself. Um, and it's also uh, one of the first things you said to me when you saw one of my, my, my uh, first attempts at a comic is like too many words. <laughs> and I thought, okay, too many words. Uh, it's taking them a while to understand too, my students is, is that, that they become part of a team. And I think that's what I was not grasping. Uh, and one of the things I discovered writing for the Sandman over the, the previous two years is um, you're part of a team and it's, it's wonderful. And partly props to uh, the Vertigo and DC editors for putting that team together uh, and being sort of the go-betweens. But it was so much fun to, I mean, I write prose, I make marks in black on a white background and all of a sudden I'm seeing these characters show up that have three dimensions and personalities and color and, and they're people. It was astounding. And I began well, to learn, uh, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say, let me interrupt you because we have someone in the waiting room, a special guest coming to join us. And uh, here she comes. This is Jill Thompson, a writer, artist, cartoonist, creator of Scary Godmother, and uh, those books spawned two television specials. She's illustrated uh, a Sandman issue called Parliament of Rooks that introduced the world to the Little Endless, which she designed. She's collaborated with Neil Gaiman on a pivotal Sandman arc, one of my favorite arcs called Brief Lives. And she's written and drawn several Sandman spin-offs, including the Little Endless storybook and a manga, Death at Death's Door. So welcome, Jill. Great to have you join us today. How are you doing? Hi, Mark. It's great to see you again. I wish we could be together in person, but this way, at least we get to see your awesome library. <laughs> and we get some background from you, which is great. Oh, I like, like to see cluttered that. cluttered background. I'm trying to keep my shoulder up in the way so you don't see my mess of my kitchen back there. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I was asking Nalo about the power of fantasy and your work, you've done all kinds of different work, but you've been really drawn to mythology in the work that you've done with Wonder Woman and uh, folklore and of course fantasy in, in the work with Neil Gaiman. So why are you drawn to that, that genre? I suppose because I'm a witch, I guess. <laughs> um, I, uh, that's just what I've come to realize. Uh, after years and years and years. I don't know. I've l always liked what, when I was growing up, were considered the nerdy things, which was doing well in school, but also 
all mythologies. Um, I've always liked fairy tales and storytelling and, and tale, folk tales of, of any kind. Um, when I was really little, I liked to be read to. Um, my grandmother used to read me fairy tales, um, like Grimm's fairy tales, before I would go to sleep. And also some really weird books that must have been her childhood like school primers that had fairy tales and stuff that I've never seen or heard anywhere else. They were really beautifully illustrated, but, um, and they were all like one I can remember, oh gosh, it's like poor little Aslog or something like that. And then there was like one girl that was like little one eye, little two eye and little three eyes. And it was about, you know, it was set like fairy tale, kind of Arthur Rackamy looking uh, illustrations, but uh, it, you know, it was like a poor peasant guy that had three daughters and one of them had one eye, like a cyclops. Another one was the normal one with two eyes and another one had three eyes and he was trying to marry all of them off. Um, and they all had, you know, they all kind of conspired together based on the abilities that they would have with like the fact that they had one eye or two eyes or three eyes. I don't, I mean, I don't remember much about the story other than that, but there were a lot of like weird macabre style um, things in there that should have and probably did scare the heck out of me as a kid, but also intrigued me just about the fantastic and um, the fact that someone wrote that, uh, that he could read it and what was it trying to teach me? Um, and that there should be magic in the world. So, I mean, everything that I saw when I was a kid had some kind of magic correlation to me. I was out walking and I found a stone with a hole in it. Oh, that means I can look to see other, it was a magic key to something. Um, I can't say why, um, but all I, all I know is that it's always been there for me. And just from the time I've been little, I've wanted to tell stories in some way or another. And comics became at a really, really, really early age. Like by the time I was six, uh, I was telling stories like in a strip manner, like Snoopy, like Peanuts first. And then um, I moved on from Peanuts to Archie Comics, where then I understood you know, how storytelling worked that way. And then Archie's to superheroes and superheroes to everything else. Um, so much so that now I can't read anything without breaking it down into panel <laughs> for myself. I mean, even the newspaper, I, I, I can read a newspaper story and I'm thinking like how I would draw it. I, I find it fascinating too that all three of us, it seems to me that storytelling and our interest in storytelling came from our families. I, that just fascinates me that we all grew up in families with books. I, you know, we're very, very lucky that we had that in our background. Yeah. Oh, the, unusually, uh, my family does not have books like you have books. Like it would be random books around. Like no one had a bookcase. I'm like probably the first person in my family, uh, like, you know, I was like, I must have and hoard these books. They are my favorite. But I would, I mean, I remember it. I think it's, it's very important to be read to or to be told the story, I suppose it's the equivalent of sitting down around a fire and being told the folk tales of your people if that's how you, your people did stuff. Um, because there were, it was always stories of some kind. It wasn't like my family had a lot of books, but I remember the time in grade school when you would sit and the teacher would read to you or someone would come in and read to you or a parent would come in for you know um, parent help for a day where they would help out and there was always a story time. And that obviously resonated with me. Uh, and then the library was my best, most favorite thing to go to and lose myself in the stacks. Of course, I would take out the same books over and over again. Um, a lot of times it was almost like, it was like owning them without being able to own them. So I would, I had certain books that I liked. In fact, I have one, I have a couple of them here. And the book club at school, like when you could, you know, the scholastic book club or whatever it was where you would have the kind of little paper catalog and you could pick things out and give your money and then, a couple of months later, the books would arrive to the school in the big box. And oh my gosh, like if 
I always wanted to be the kid that got the most books out of that. So. I, I'm showing my age. Scholastic didn't exist when I was a kid. So there you go. Um, tell me a little bit, uh, Jill, how you came to Neil. You were in comics. You were well established in comics when Neil came in in the late uh, 80s. What, I was, what was okay that like? established. I wasn't well established, I would say. I had worked for a lot of smaller publishers at that point, and I had just made my leap over to DC Comics. Like, um, And so... I mean, part of it, how I came to work on Sandman, which happened to be my favorite comic at the time. Um, but uh, I guess, now Neil tells a different version of this and I, I will believe that that is part of it, but that's not what I heard from people at DC offices. So I will add his little twist to the stuff that they've told me. I was working on Wonder Woman at the time and um, that was back in the day when you mailed in actual physical pages to your publisher and then your editor got them and they went then to the letterer and then they came back and then they went to the inker. You know, they all had to go, like it went, my house, DC, DC, letterer, letterer, DC, DC, inker, inker, DC, DC colorist, right? So the pages kept coming back to DC for uh, um, many different steps of it. And because Neil was just starting out and Karen was, um, I guess, starting to like, I don't know what's a good word for this, uh, mine England for writers or bring more English writers to American comics fold. Um, Wait, there's a there's a there's a nicer term for that. Would be like, uh, source. Scout. She was source. Scout. Scout. Scouting. Source. Scouting. There you go. Yeah. Um, so she was scouting out, and she was looking for you know like more more Alan Moores and more um, Jamie Delano's and stuff. And yeah, because Alan Moores just live on trees. You can just pluck an Alan Moore out every <laughs> once in a while. <laughs> they live under trees, but in a in, in a, like roots. a big tree that looks like a <laughs> yeah in the roots and, then, and you have to bring them special presents or they'll be grouchy and do magic at you um so uh neil would every once in a while come to new york and everybody goes to the dc offices and karen told me that while he would come in and they would have meetings and stuff like that sometimes my pages were on on the desk and he would look at all the pages that were there and he liked my work or he saw my pencils and he liked them and he wanted to know when I was, you know, like what, could I draw something for Sandman or when he was working on Sandman. And um, I was under an exclusive contract. So I had no idea any of like this had ever happened. Um, and then uh, there was a, San Diego Comic Convention where Neil was there, I was there, but I was an artist alley and I, had, I was going up to the DC booth for something and uh, I got introduced to him uh, and he, he said, are you, are you Jill, Jill Thompson? I just, I just saw the most lovely drawing of death you did in the nude. And I was stunned because yes, a fan had asked me to draw one of those. Can you draw my favorite character naked drawings that now they put on DeviantArt and nobody really asks an artist to their human face to draw that kind of thing. <laughs> and because um, I was very proud of my life drawing and I didn't want to cater to this guy's fetish. So I was like, yes, I will take your money to draw you this character. But she was all very demure and um, didn't really show anything at all, right? So like very, Gil Elfgren or, um, you know, Olivia style pinup art where you didn't see anything, but she obviously wasn't wearing any clothes, but I was mortified. Um, and he was like, that was very lovely. And I wanted to crawl into a hole and die. And then he was like, would you like to draw some Sandman? And I thought he was just kidding. Um, and so, uh, while well, I was still working on Wonder Woman and my editor at the time, Dan Thorslin, said that Neil was always coming in and asking when I, you know, was I available, could I draw something? Cause he had like a whole little arc that he thought would be perfect for me, which was Brief Lives. 
but nobody was telling me that at the time. And he thought I would be, Dan thought I would be much better fit for the stuff that Neil wrote than the kind of current superhero stuff that I was working on. And he figured out, but apparently everyone was just saying, oh, oh no, she's, she's got a contract for Wonder Woman, so she can't do this. And they would just kind of dismiss Neil and never tell me about it. And Dan Thorsland actually said, I'm gonna see if I can like slide you over, get your contract slid over and, and, and do that. Um, and then I started working on Sandman. <laughs> so um, it was kind of a weird, happy accident. And um, I'm really glad it happened because it was the most excellent fit for me. And I got Let's to draw that to my me. favorite comic. What a, so first, of all, why was it your favorite comic? I mean, there were, there were, I don't know, there were like 40 or 50 comics coming out that month, you know, when Sandman started at the end of the 80s. Like, there's a lot of material to choose from by a lot of great people. And Sandman wasn't universally read by people. It, maybe the sales are around 40,000 copies. And, oh my um, God, don't you wish someone would sell 40,000 copies right now? Yeah, I, that's right. But at the time, when you compared it to like the Image Boys, who were like millions of copies, oh, right, Sandman right. was just the little engine that could. But what was it about it that Sandman or, and Neil's writing that you connected to? Oh man, that's a hard question to ask. Um, it, it just hit you, hit me on a personal level. I was like, this was an, it was an intense well-written comic that just there was nothing out there like it um but i mean at the, it's it's not that i didn't i didn't like superhero books or or other things i i did it it's it just like it was unlike anything else the same way when that love and rock when love at rockets came out like when you like read you know the death of speedy ortiz or something like that you know like you're looking at something different something that you know like Jaime Hernandez to me like the best American novelist of the 20th century <laughs> um or 21st century now um but Neil's comics were they worked on a bunch of different levels that comics at the time didn't you know he set a different bar I don't know you know it's like when somebody gives you something you say read this and tell me what you think and you're just like oh my god <laughs> Why was I, uh, what, where does this come from? Like, oh, are there more of these? I don't, I don't know how to describe it. Well, tell, tell, I want to just go back to Nalo for a second. What was your reaction when Neil asked you to join uh, the Sandman universe team? Well, I like to have a slightly different story <laughs> about how that went. Um, I was at um, a comics festival in, San Francisco, went back to my hotel room, a black comics festival, went back to my hotel room. There's an email from Vertigo saying, want to talk. Um, so I called them and they said, well, we are rebooting the Sandman with four new stories. Would you like to pitch for one of them? And here's the four stories. And when they told me House of Whispers, I said, that's, that's the one I'm pitching for. Um, I assumed that Neil had given them my name, but I was going to pitch for it. So I found out how to write a pitch <laughs> for a comic and it's the worst pitch ever. No one will ever, ever see it again. Uh, two years went by and I didn't hear from them. And then I heard from a different editor because that previous one had moved on. And he said, are you still interested? I'm like, did you like my pitch? <laughs> they sort of leapt over to your writing this. Um, so that was what I received on my end was, would you pitch for this? And I figured they were contacting me because Neil had told them about me. Um, and what was it like? They said, would you like to write a Sandman story? And I said, duh, <laughs> yes, yes, I would. Um, and it was exhausting. It was two years of exhausting producing a monthly script, even when they brought in Dan Waters to co-write with me and that was the best experience ever. Um, but it was still exhausting. And whenever I got really tired and just last hairy thread of, of energy, I'd say, I am writing a fucking Sandman comic. <laughs> and the energy would surge back. Um, it was, it was, um, it was an experience. It was two years of an experience uh, that was very, very profound. And I had moments where, um, 
what was the first one? There was a, an, an issue where I wanted to, I had a sex scene in it and um, the editors were fine with it, but somebody higher up right. had, had, had an issue with it. And I thought, I'm gonna tell. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I emailed Neil and went, and he said, it's the bat penis, isn't it? And I said, the what now? Because <laughs> I haven't been reading super oh. comics for a while. And he said, there's an issue with a full frontal of Batman. I'm like, all right, I'm, I'm going to find that and get back to you. <laughs> you can barely see that. <laughs> I looked real hard. <laughs> um, right. So there was this, this, this wonderful experience of, of uh, being supported, but also somebody with the history of how things were working and who came into that writers meeting that we had in New Orleans and where the four of us, the four different writers of the four different stories had been trying to coordinate everything. So the stories work together and they had an arc that, and he said, you're trying too hard. I have these toys, they're in the sandbox, go play. And the whole thing sort of reconfigured itself in my mind and all of a sudden it just felt way more possible to do. And that generosity was amazing. So Julie, you have a similar thing after working on Brief Lives, which is, you know, a big major arc, you then it looks to me like you were given some sandbox because you got to do the endless storybook, which is, I mean, my God, I don't have one in my house because my daughter took it. It's that was her one of her favorite books. Well that and means you, you to need do... to buy multiple copies. That's what are you right. To I do. do. That's right. Send and me then, the royalties. That's right. And then and then you got to do the manga version of death. So tell me about those, like how much freedom were you given to work in that sandbox? Oh my gosh. Um, I have not, I have felt so honored when I was asked to do this. And I'll, I mean, both ways, like just that Neil trusted me with those characters because personally, um, you know, you get attached to, there are different writers that you like on certain things, uh, but you know that, you know, if it's a certain type of comic, there's always going to be another writer and do a certain take and you can, you know, maybe the, you like it, maybe you don't. But when it's something so completely associated with one, you know, creator, which would be Sandman, hold that, I have to yell at the cats. Oberon, stop scratching that. Um, just because I know how to of rescreen the back door LeBron. doesn't mean, <laughs> yes, just because my, I know how to rescreen the back door doesn't mean I want to keep doing it like every month because his, don't, don't let them tell you that anything is like animal proof screening. I have aluminum screening that I put in my screen door and he's able to like shred through it like nobody's business. Stop it. Don't make me get up now. <gasps> Can you hear it? Can you hear the scratching? Oh my gosh. Oh, okay. Anyway, um, so uh, when I was given the opportunity, oh, everyone went away. Oh, we're here. Oh, is everyone we're here? here. here? Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, we're here. Right. We're just okay, we're Mark, shutting yeah. up and listening to your story. Oh, no, no. <laughs> all right. Well, no, your face went away, and there was just a little black, a th black square with a tea cap in it. Um, so, uh, you know, this is the weird thing. A lot of my stories. People expect that there's going to be like some amazing backstory to it. And a lot of it is really kind of pedestrian. Um, but this one is pedestrian in kind of a really flattering way. Sandman was over. There was no more, uh, no more like regular series of Sandman at the time. And um, the kids were loving that manga, right? <laughs> so... Uh, it was coming everywhere. Everyone was publishing it. Uh, bookstores had giant sections of the, their bookstores devoted to it. And apparently a uh, bookstore representative or like the publishing house, like, um, like a Barnes and Noble representative uh, was coming to Karen and saying, why don't you have manga coming out from you? Everyone's selling manga, you guys should be selling manga versions of you know these characters and um they should be do you should be doing uh like sandman totally could be a great shoujo manga and karen's like well i don't know anything about manga 
Um, but I'll ask Neil. So she asked Neil and Neil was like, I don't know enough about manga to do this, but why don't you ask Jill? Because I think Jill could do it, which was super high praise. Uh, but then, uh, so she was, but you know, she went back to the bookseller and said, well, Neil doesn't want to do it. And she figured that nobody would want anything because Neil would be the draw for that as well. And the guy was like, okay, I get it. That's a valid reason. He doesn't, he's like, why don't you ask Jill Thompson? So even that guy brought up my name and she was like, huh? So she was like, okay. So then she called me and she's like, this is what's going on. This is what we kind of think can happen. And we're thinking about doing this, but we want to test it out. And, you know, we're wondering like, could you, could you do this? Like either make up a whole new manga or adapt something. And I was like, I think, first of all, I said, sure, I can do that. Uh, and then after I hung up the phone, I was like, boy, I hope I can do that. Um, but, uh, and that comes from my art school training, which was to take the job, take whatever job that comes to you and figure out if you know the style afterwards. Um, but no, I'd loved manga for years, uh, so much so that I, I mean, I used to get bootleg videos of anime that were not in English, but they're, you know, recordings of a recording of a recording of a recording. So it's like the color was not good. It was all like very bad quality. You could barely hear it, but still it was like, it's Totoro. <laughs> um, uh, or go into Japanese markets and buy manga that I couldn't read, but I figured if I could tell the story was going on, still I had them. So I had like all the phone book mangas from the time I was like maybe 14 or 15, I was searching that kind of stuff out. So I figured I would research it and then try and everything that I could assimilate as, as a person, uh, not of Japanese origin. I knew a lot of Japanese comic storytelling is just like cultural from the way they grow up and things and I asked some of my Japanese friends to try and explain things. You know, it's like, I think this cross hatching means one thing. I think this special effect means another thing. And she was like, you're right about these things, but this, and she would point to certain things. She goes, I don't even know how I could explain that to you. I was like, okay, well then anything I think about that type of thing is wrong. I won't incorporate it. Um, so when I started, uh, so I accepted that job and uh, decided that I should make up a story, but also include a story that would bring people who didn't, who only read manga to other Sandman comics if they wanted, and also had familiar stuff for people who already read Sandman, who maybe didn't read manga. So we could cross both worlds. And, um, most retailers that I have spoken to over the course of my career, when they were talking about how they would introduce people to Sandman who had never read it, would be they would give them a season of mists because it was like a completely self-contained storyline. It had one also had you know great art uh, in it, but it introduced the whole family as well, and you got a taste of a lot of people's personalities. So I figured and the and then I figured, how could I add another story to that story, which is a perfect story. And I didn't want to mess up any of the continuity that was already happening or give an alternative version. But I was like, there's one scene where Dream and Death are talking to each other. And Death's like, I'm super impatient, emo boy. Um, you don't understand what's happening back here. And he's like, wow, wow. Why am I, why should, what should happen? Because I, you know, was pissed off 10,000 years ago and sent my lover to hell for that period of time. And she's like, uh. so I thought there's a story about what's going on with her while all of this stuff is going on. And I was like, I want to tell the story behind the, the, you know, the picture frame that she was in, in his gallery while he's having all this intense drama happening. And then I can still do my version of that. Everyone gets left back the way it was, I don't mess up continuity at all. And it's kind of like a fun little romp that happens behind the scenes. But the fact, and I talked to Neil about it and, you know, cause he has to okay everything. And he liked that. Um, at one point he didn't understand why it was gonna be so long. 
and I said, I'm actually shortening this because if this was truly a regular shoju manga, this might, you know, you might have 25 pages is just like reaction back and forth of like how someone was going to be afraid to talk to that person. <laughs> um, so um, to get his approval was really great to know that a lot of people outside of just inside the office thought I could handle something like that. And they were looking forward to seeing me do it meant that my storytelling was, you know, good enough to write other comics. Um, but I feel like if, if you kind of boil it down to basically what it was, it's like, how can we cash in on this manga thing that's happening? Well, we're a little late to the party, but, uh, but I know it did well. It, it did really well. Um, it was on like the New York Times bestseller, like comic or manga, manga list that was one of them one of the only ones that wasn't a real manga or Japanese manga and then um but it was hard to do it was hard to stay in that style um and I lettered it and penciled and inked the whole thing and Karen was like when's the next one coming and I'm like <laughs> I, I can't do another one of these it's <laughs> I, I, I thought like once I was working on it, you would you would say, OK, this is going to work. Let's start having other people do it. But no, she was like, you have to do more. And it was like it it was very physically demanding to do that, to make myself stay drawing in that style. And I ended up having tendonitis because of it um, and some other things. Um, but with the little end of storybook, that also was something that I had drawn those little chibi characters, the, the tiny versions of Sandman and Death in a Hello Kitty-ish style on my very first story in Sandman. Um, when Neil and I would do signings together, uh, at one point I had drawn out the whole family just for fun. When I used to draw before I started to draw every day. <laughs> um, and I brought it with me to a, uh, to a signing and fans who were in line were like, what's that? And Neil decided he would always send the retailer out with that piece of artwork to go and um, to the Kinkos and like Xerox a hundred copies. And then we would sell them for the CBLDF. And then when we would get down to the, almost the last copy. They would take that copy and they would run across to the other place and do some more. So, um, just because I had made the entire family like that, I started coming up with ideas for like little, you know, how could I tell a story that would be with all those cute little characters? And Neil and I kept asking for like to, for me to be able to do it for years and years and years and no one okayed it. And I forget how it finally got okayed. Um, I forget who convinced Paul Levitz to put it out because he was like, we can't put that out for Vertigo, it's for children. It's like, it's for children of all ages. And that's how we should put it. And it's like, I don't think anyone who's gonna pick, pick this up is gonna pick up regular Sandman because technically a little kid can't just walk into a comic book shop and pick up Sandman. You know, there's, you know, it's a mature label. He's like, but Vertigo is mature. We can't put that. And I said, let's put for readers, uh, for mature readers of all ages. So it just means about your mental maturity. <laughs> you know, it's like, I didn't even use the word death in that because we were afraid that it would be too upsetting. So it was like her oldest sister is how, she, how death is referred to. So. Um. Wow, that's amazing. Well, uh, we're just winding down, but I wanted to ask you both the question, what, working with Neil's sandbox, what have you learned about storytelling? Well, maybe start with you, Nalo. Well, I was also, you know, learning about comic storytelling uh, and you know what a comic to cut your eye teeth on <laughs> um, the, one of the things that happened right away is that vertigo kept asking me what I had planned for the story and I'm a total pantser like I, I write the story to figure out what the story is going to be so that became this thing where they kept trying to find different ways to get me to tell them what I had planned and I had nothing planned so it just wasn't working um, and then I started working, co-writing with uh, Dan Waters and he's, he's more of an old hand at this uh, and we would sit down and plot out story arcs together. Um, and I discovered, you know, the same thing that you find in prose is that 
you might have this idea of how things are going to work and then you'll find something inside the story that sort of lifts it beyond uh, the, the, for me, usually very pedestrian plot arc I have planned. Um, and to find that was the same thing there was great. I also um, began to learn how to do collaborative storytelling. So uh, my first imagination of um, Elsie Lee in her House of Whispers, I knew I was going to set in New Orleans. I put her in a houseboat. She was going to live on the water. She's a deity of the water. And it was, you know, your average houseboat that's that's basically a tiny, 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 tiny apartment. Sent it to Domo, the, the, uh, the inker, and he had made it one of the grand steamboats that you see on the, on the river um, in New Orleans. And I thought that's perfect because the first, very first scene you have with her in is a ball. She's having a party for all her worshipers. So it's huge. And I had had them you know, outside in little spaces on the hospital. No, he just, huge ballroom. There were go-go boys in the ceiling. There were <laughs> sapper. And I thought he just made it better. And so learning to trust and work with the other artists. And, and, and I always say when I'm talking to uh, people who don't, you, know comics very well that when I say artists, I mean the inker, I mean the colorist, I mean the letterer, I mean everybody, the, the person doing the cover art, these are all this convergence. I learned what ink, I learned what lettering was, uh, hearing Darren Bennett talk about how he would do things like signal the distance between two characters or the space or how he would signal the quality of somebody's voice by how he drew the balloon. Um, I just learned so much and I'm still absorbing it. You know, how many years I finished in 2020. So a year later, I'm still sort of absorbing all the things I learned about storytelling. Um, and I think it's making its way into my prose as well. So it's, it's been a very synergistic experience. What about you, Jill? Um, I would very much like to uh, add to what she said here. Uh, I, uh, being an old comic pro hand, uh, like a comic creator, um, the one thing that I've, I've seen when people who have come from a novel uh, world, right, they're used to describing everything for the reader to imagine. And technically that's all the art direction that you're giving your artist. Um, but sometimes, um, I've seen this happen before, sometimes uh, people expect that you're gonna be able to draw exactly what they see in their head. And unless you want that, um, you know, it's like, unless you give them a photo, it's like, this is a room from my childhood that I really want depicted in this story. It's very important to me. The way that I can copy that photo, but if you just describe your childhood room to you, or me or Kelly Jones or someone else, we're going to draw a room that has all of those aspects, but it's not gonna look the same. And the best part about collaborating uh, in comics is that you have to trust your artists, you know? And everything that she said about lettering too, it's like, I could talk for an hour on why lettering is super important. And it's not just a font that you get on the computer and throw on something. It's like, it's the shape of the balloon and how you space things and where you put it and the size of the lettering. And it, it, it's your dialogue and your pauses and you can create emotion in that as well as the body language. And those things are created by the writer and then interpreted by the artist who is also the writer. And I think like the best comics come from like, almost a synergistic combo. I mean, you would say obviously that Stanley and Jack Kirby had that because Jack Kirby wasn't writing a full script for Jack Kirby. Um, but also when I was working with Neil, I know I hit that flow with him and it working with him was like the easiest collaboration I've ever had with a writer because of the story, like the, the storytelling quality of his scripts uh, if you ever heard him read some of his own prose work, I felt like that's what it was like. Every time I hear him read, I tell him that's what it was like working on comics with you. It was like, you told me a story and then I was drawing it. 
And then sometimes he would say, when I would fax him my pages of like what I had finished because I was very proud and I wanted to show him. And um, he, he on a couple of occasions said, that's exactly what I pictured in my head, which has never happened to me with any other writer. I've been fortunate enough to work with writers who, you know, they really love the way I interpreted what they wrote. Um, and, and when I write for somebody else too, I know that it's not gonna be the thing I see in my head. Sometimes I don't even draw the thing I see in my head right. <laughs> um, but it is such an awesome collaborative process. And uh, it's, it's funny when people who work outside of comics come to comics, they find it to be intimidating. And I think what needs to be done, and I, maybe I have to do this, is just tell you how to write for an artist because I think they look and think, should I write a, a script, like a TV script or a movie script? Or, or how many panels does it have to have? Or how, like a formula of how a page is supposed to work. And there are so many different people, uh, like different artists. I know Craig Russell has talked about this, like on storytelling, what he does. But I try and like, I work up to a moment that's the most important in that page of the script for me, the way it, when I'm laying it out, or I work away from that. Um, we're trying to create tension or, you know, deal with the page turn, which also has an impact, you know, that microsecond of turning the page is so different than just scrolling up to another page. Um, also that when you're describing something happening in a panel, I know that uh, people who come from film often tend to write what they think is one motion in one action that would actually be a pen, like a shot penning in, like in a crane that moves in. Um, when you should, that should be, that was like, well, that's a page's worth of stuff. And sometimes editors don't want to tell that professional from another, in another industry that, you know, I can't correct them because, you know, they're a pro. It's like, no, what you're doing is you're going to tell them how to more effectively write for this medium. You're not telling them that their idea is bad. You're just telling them it's like, that's three motions. So, you know, dial it in, choose one or make that the whole, like the whole page and then move the main action onto page two. You know, that's not insulting unless you are insulting in the way that you tell it to them. <laughs> um, but I think it would save people a lot of stress when they're starting to write you know, when they want to adapt their comic story to know like just how to, how to moreover do an outline for a page. Mm -hmm. That's what yeah, we're what learning now. Is and one of the things I really noticed from, yeah, one of the things I really noticed from you, Jill, is the, you, you're just a great actor. You, your characters really act. And, and I, that must have had a big impact on Neil as well when he knew he'd get away with not using dialogue, because some of the most effective things in Brief Lives are silent sequences. Um, he asked, that's one of the things he asked me. I mean, I, uh, Neil asked me this, and I think he asked every artist before he worked with them is what do you like to draw? What are your favorite things to draw? And he tailors the scripts towards your strengths. So the, my answer to that was because I just finished Wonder Woman and I was like, I hate to draw cars um, just because they're very hard it's even if you do it really properly and I have all reference and everything, the proportion of people next to cars, it always looks, it, for me, it's hard. It's not impossible, but it's just something I don't want to do on every panel. So I said, I don't like to draw cars, but more specifically, I don't like to draw one guy hitting another guy in the face with a car, especially the underside of a car, which you can never find reference of. And when you go to the mechanics down the block and say, can I walk in here and take pictures underneath this car? They tend to look at you funny. Like, why does this person want that? Because that was before the internet, before I could look up, what does the underside of a car look like? And there's like schematics and things. Um, and so he, and then he said, what do you like to draw? And I said, I like to draw um, characters emoting. I like quiet scenes and I like, uh, I like to push myself to see how, you know, how I can make the character act on a static, you know, static page. And Brief Lives was full of so much of that, that, um, 
and and it is still one of my favorite things to do it's like my job with whatever comic i'm doing is to make you feel something whether it's to laugh or be like oh that was silly or make you cry like the fact that i was weeping while i was drawing certain things in beasts of burden like openly crying and crying paint like tear dropped onto the paint painted page which left a salty water flower <laughs> from my tear uh, which i can point to all the time um, I want to be able to make other people feel this, feel that. Well, that's a fantastic way, I think, to end this uh, on emotion and how comics work. So I want to thank you both. And I think Miles is going to come in now and uh, finish us off. But thank you both so much for this. This has been, I hope, educational for everybody. Not just educational, entertaining. <laughs> thank you. I want to come to one of these New Orleans comic writer things i never get to that kind of a thing that sounds like super fun it was so much fun it only happened once it was so much fun <laughs> well we'll have to mask up and have another one yes <laughs> yeah uh thanks so much for everyone uh, participating in today's uh program uh, that was great to listen to uh i was smiling and laughing and uh learning a little bit uh as well um uh, before we go today, I need to uh, make another shout out to our uh, programming sponsor, Seneca College uh, School of Creative Arts and Animation. Uh, special thanks, of course, to the Beguiling Books and Art and Page and Panel, the TCAF shop. Uh, special thanks to our government uh, funders, the Canada Council for the Arts, the Ontario Art Council, and the Toronto Art Council. Um, please visit torontocomics.com to see more programming like this, as well as 300 exhibitors from all over the world. Our online exhibition runs until May 15 uh, with new programming going live uh, every day. Uh, one program I do want to shout out, uh, Jill, I think you would enjoy. It's going live on Sunday, May 15th. It is called No Holds Bar Wrestling and Comics uh, featuring <laughs> Jaime Hernandez, uh, Katie Skelly, Jarrett Williams, and Aubrey Sitterson. Uh, should be an awesome and fun conversation as one of our closing panels for TCAF. So you should wow, check you it out. You have to get Mike Kingston on it. Uh, we'll follow up after this. This will be great. Yeah. Because <laughs> this comic headlock is fantastic. Amazing. Uh, so yeah, everything's on torontocomics.com. Uh, visit there and uh, have a good TCAP, everybody.